Great. Well, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a first timer at, at ULF, and so I want to thank the, the ULF for for making this meeting happen and bringing uh, bringing us all together, scientists, families, patients. Uh, it's really a unique meeting from that perspective, and and one that I'm certainly taking away uh, a lot of uh, of information and uh, and interactions from that I think are, are really valuable. Um, I also want to thank the, the Yaya Foundation. It's uh, uh, appreciate being invited to present our work here, and it's been great to to meet uh, everyone and the leadership of the, the foundation in person after having interacted online uh, a few times. So, so the topic of my talk today is about uh, making mouse models of RNA polymerase three related Lucidifery or four H disease, and um, so I'll just get started here. So, um, so th this field, as we've heard already uh, this morning, it really sort of took off in 2011 with uh, a series of, of landmark papers in the, uh, the American Journal of uh, Human Genetics from the uh, Bernard and Brace groups at uh, McGill University and their collaborators in the Matsumoto group in Japan that uh, you know established the genetic identity of the mutations that that unify this disparate group of diseases that that have these these variable phenotypes that we've we've heard about so far. So these are landmark studies because once we knew genetically where to look, it was possible to identify the genetic defects in people that we united by a common set of uh, of disorders and 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 phenotypes. So this led to uh, additional important advances in the the clinical spectrum of the disease, as we've already heard uh, from Nicole about uh, this morning. And uh, uh, this has led to a, a growing number, uh, con continuing to this day, of mutations in the RNA polymerase enzyme that are associated with these, uh, these various phenotypes. And the uh, remarkable uh, phenotypic variability that we see between patients uh, with different mutations or even sometimes with the same mutations that suggest uh, genetic modifiers in our you know human population that modify disease severity and other kinds of phenomena that can impact the, how the disease is manifest in the patients. So um, in you know really what's been a relatively short period of time, only 11 years since the genetic identification of this disease, Tremendous amount has been accomplished, and, and a part of that has been whoops, I'm sorry, the development of, uh, of important research tools to study the, the cellular and molecular basis of poultry-related leukodystrophy. And this includes uh, uh, cell lines uh, engineered to contain mutations found in the patient population, patient-derived fibroblasts, and as we've heard, uh, 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 iPSCs that can be uh, turned into uh, ligodendrocytes and other cell populations that express the, the mutations. And so this has been really informative in getting some initial insights into molecularly what's going wrong uh, in the cells that have these mutations. But there's been one uh, uh, area, the, the generation of animal models, which has been particularly difficult to, to make progress on. And uh, so it's been a a challenge to make these models, but these models are really critical uh, for understanding the disease uh, in a context where all of the cells are there together uh, in, a, in a mammalian model. And that model can be used ultimately to understand disease pathogenesis and to, to test potential uh, therapies before they go into clinical trials. And so it's, uh, it's our efforts to, to try and uh, do this, which I'm gonna be talking about today. But before I get into the, the details of how we've been going about making animal models here, I think it's it's helpful for you to have uh, some perspective about the field in which you know I've been working and, and many others as well. And um, and so you know the, the field is uh, of the polymerase three transcription is really uh, quite advanced, and so uh, it's a mature field of research. It's actually been going on for 
for over 40 years, which is you know about the same amount of time that the ULF uh, Foundation has been been meeting, right? And so the, the fundamental knowledge about RNA polymerase three transcription is really well advanced because of the many, many years and decades that people have been studying the system. And because of that, this is what we're hoping to try and leverage to really make a rapid progress in understanding the, the molecular and cellular basis of the disease and help to inform ways to develop new uh, approaches to, to therapeutics. Um, so uh, a, vast, whoops, a vast amount of information has been uh, obtained uh, over this period um, using uh, model organisms uh, from yeast to human cells, frogs, flies, worms, everything you can imagine as basic systems to try and study the biology of polymerase three transcription and understand uh, its, uh, its impact when it's perturbed. Um, the machinery of the poultry system is really well understood. People have been able to take extracts from eukaryotic cells, uh, add exogenous genes to those extracts and have them transcribe. Uh, RNA polymerase three transcripts make them in vitro and, and by that very nature to, to fractionate those extracts and understand the nature of the proteins that are required for this process. And so this is all very well known and described these days. Uh, in the case of the, you know, the, the most commonly studied type of RNA polymerase three transcript, the, the tRNA genes, these are the most abundant RNAs uh, in eukaryotic cells or in any cells for that matter. Um, and their transcription requires just 26 proteins. There's six proteins that are made up by a single transcription factor that binds to the promoters of these genes. That transcription factor recruits a three subunit initiation complex uh, to the genes. And that assembly is then recognized by the 17 subunit polymerase, which is carrying out the transcription. So it's a relatively simple system in terms of the number of components. The regulation of the system has also been studied in great detail under diverse conditions. It's a system that's extremely sensitive to, to nutrients and nutrient stress. And in fact, all kinds of stress, environmental stresses and cellular stresses. It's also a system that is targeted uh, typically in, uh, in oncogenic transformation in, in cancer. Uh, poultry transcription is vital to cell growth and under conditions where cell growth control is lost, this process is upregulated. And so the poultry system has been uh, heavily focused on to understand uh, growth dysregulation in cancer. And as a consequence of that, we know a lot about the, uh, the major signaling pathways and key regulators of this process. The function of poultry transcripts themselves are uh, generally uh, well described. I've already mentioned the tRNA molecules as the major component of that. Uh, these molecules, of course, are the, we refer to them as the interpreters of the genetic code because they carry the amino acids to the ribosome and recognize the triplet code in, in protein synthesis. There are many other types of poultry transcripts that are made in our cells. They have very diverse functions from roles in messenger RNA splicing, protein secretion, regulation of gene expression, and others. And so we know quite a lot about these functions. But, but RNA is a, a bewildering, bewildering molecule in many ways, and we're still learning about new functions or non-canonical functions for RNAs that we've been studying for many years. And you know, one class of, of these RNAs, which is relatively uh, newly described and is, uh, whose studies are still ongoing, are uh, a class called uh, tRNA-derived fragments, which are uh, pieces of tRNA molecules that are generated by the, their partial breakdown that actually have other biological functions. And all of these these things, these TRFs, the normal functions of tRNAs and the other poultry transcripts, all of these can, can perturb 
the biology of our cells in ways that could potentially impact disease. And this is what we're interested in trying to understand. So uh, overall, there's a, there's a wealth of information to consider in the context of disease, whether that disease is leukodystrophy or cancer or uh, immune disorders and so forth and, and so on. And, and as I've already said, this is what we're trying to leverage in the context of 4-H to, to uh, move things forward. So, um, you know, my lab has been uh, doing this research uh, at Einstein, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York for, for some 34 years. I started as a postdoc before that working in this system. So I have a, a long history working here, but, but the field is, um, is quite large and active. Um, and I have a, an image to show you of a, a group from a recent meeting. So uh, we get together every two years and have done so since 1986 to present and discuss our work on the system. Um, uh, we did this as an isolated Pol 3 community in the early days. And in uh, the late 90s, we uh, gathered together with the people working on RNA polymerase 1 realizing that there are many commonalities in the systems that we study. RNA polymerase 1 makes the large uh, RNA components of the ribosome that's involved in protein synthesis that uh, POL3 transcription also participates in. And so we've been meeting together for some 12 meetings now. Um, and given the, the names of our enzymes are, you know, numbered oddly, we're affectionately labeled ourselves as the odd poles meeting. And uh, in, in recent years, we've been uh, attracting other groups who, who may not have odd names, but are nonetheless odd polymerases. And so we welcome them to the family as well. Okay, so let's talk uh, more about the models and, and how we make them. So modeling poultry related leukodystrophy. So this, as I, as I said in, in my beginning remarks, has been a, a challenging problem. And uh, the challenge here is in part because while mice are uh, indispensable for modeling human disease, they're not human, right? And, um, and, and conversely, humans are not mice. And so this uh, sometimes comes home to roost in, in your experiments where you find that something that you expect to have occurred uh, using a mouse model for a human disease, in fact, doesn't happen. And uh, that was the case in the, the first mouse model of pol 3 leukodystrophy that was, was generated by the, the Bernard and, and Brace groups at, at McGill in work that we were um, uh, happy to be involved in in a small way. But the, the, the experiments involved uh, generating a mouse that contained a homozygous POLR3A mutation, a founder mutation in the, pop, in the human population, um, but it didn't have disease. It was perfectly fine. And moreover, POL3 transcription in those mice uh, appeared to be normal. And so um, this sort of suggested uh, that in fact, mice are less sensitive to the diseases, to the mutations that cause disease in humans and in fact, what we needed to do was to make a stronger mutation in order to model the disease in mice. So this is what we wanted to do. And the approach that my lab took to do this involved using uh, budding yeast, my favorite uh, small organism, because you can make beer and bread with it, and I like brewing, right? uh, to use budding yeast as a eukaryotic model system to try and stratify the effects or uh, score the rank the effects of severity of different mutations to make a stronger allele. And so we generate a, gen generated a series of single and double mutant disease causing poultry leukodystrophy mutations and put them into yeast and measured their, the ability of the yeast cells to grow on agar plates. And that's what you're looking at here. So yeast, Favorite temperature is 30 degrees, that's its optimum. And what you can see in this panel here is that here's a wild type strain in a series of single mutants. And down here is another single mutant, this is the founder mutation. And when you look at the relative growth of these, these strains on this agar plate, they're all the same, right? So there's no phenotype for these disease causing alleles in yeast. 
similar to the founder mutation in mouse, in fact. So, so we've made a, a number of double mutants combining different disease-causing alleles. And fortunately, some of those had some phenotypes. And you can see two examples here, one in the red box, where growth at 30 degrees is diminished somewhat and clearly more severely in this other mutation. And that's at the optimal temperature. When we shift to suboptimal or non-optimal temperatures, we see uh, heat-sensitive and cold-sensitive phenotypes. So these differences in the strength of the growth of the cells on this plate is an indication that uh, enzyme function has been compromised and the ability of the cells to survive and grow has been altered as well. So um, given the properties of, uh, of this particular mutant uh, in, in growth in this particular uh, experiment, we did a number of other experiments on that particular mutant and found decreased expression of pol 3 transcription in yeast cells, which is good. Decreased transcription by purified RNA polymerase 3 from those cells in the test tube. So we knew the enzyme had a measurable biochemical defect. And uh, this became the mutant then that we chose to, uh, to engineer uh, into mice to try and model the disease. So we made the construct in the mouse and we, uh, we certainly got a more severe disease phenotype. Unfortunately, we, we overdid it a little bit, right? So uh, the mice that, have, uh, that are homozygous for this double mutant pol 3 a uh, pol R3A mutation, they don't survive embryogenesis. So this is not a viable uh, animal model. So at that point, we had to uh, retool our genetic approach. And instead of expressing this mutant gene in all cells in the mouse, just pick on a population of cells and target them and see if we can generate viable models that have phenotypes. And that's what we're able to do. Uh, we use conditional expression of this mutant uh, in order to get uh, viable mice to study. And in choosing how we would do this, we were motivated by the, the hypermyelination phenotype that's seen in the MRI images of patients. And so we targeted as a result, cells of the Oleg II lineage. So these are the cells that comprise primarily the oligodendrocyte precursors and the mature oligodendrocytes are the, the cells that make the actual myelin. And it was those cells and only those cells that were expressing the mutation. And uh, we were able to generate uh, viable uh, animals that uh, exhibit a subset of uh, clinical features that are seen in patients. So I'm gonna show you some of those phenotypes in the mouse now and try, try and relate that to, to the patient. So, uh, so what we see in these mice, we call them pol R3A conditional knock-in or CKI mice. CKI mice. They have impaired growth uh, as, as neonates, as you can see here from, uh, from birth to 21 days of age, which is when the mice are weaned. Uh, in the males, quite uh, pronounced uh, uh, difference in body weight, uh, which persists in the animals as they age through adolescence and adulthood. You can also see in older animals, they're not as, as long. Uh, the, the size is definitely smaller. Uh, and so this growth defect is something that, or uh, growth difference is something that is uh, sometimes seen in the patient population. In testing these neonates during this um, uh, very early period, we also know, noticed that they had delayed acquisition of developmental milestones. And that was the first indication that we maybe had some, some neuronal defects in these animals. We've looked at this uh, extensively in the adult population and identified using behavioral studies, a defect in cognitive function, thermal and acoustic sensory responses, and fine sensory motor control, all of which is suggestive of a hypermyelination defect uh, uh, resulting in the decreased nerve impulse conductance. So in our original goal, when we set out to do this, was to try and uh, develop a hypermyelination model. So did we manage to achieve that? Uh, the answer is yes. 
And so our mice do in fact exhibit uh, hypermyelination in discrete brain regions. So here are just two examples of several experiments of different types which, which demonstrate that point. Uh, over here, we're looking at uh, immunofluorescence of myelin basic protein, one of the constituents of myelin. And what you can see in the cerebral cortex here in the wild type versus the knock-in, or in the corpus callosum here in the wild type versus knock-in, or in the hippocampus, wild type versus knock-in, a reduced intensity of staining of this myelin basic protein uh, indicating the hypermyelination phenotype. But it's not throughout the brain. And in fact, it's quite striking that we don't see any changes in the staining of this myelin protein in the cerebellum. This is a result we still don't understand, but it's an intriguing observation that the, the phenotypes are not fully penetrated across all brain regions that, that contain myelin. So here's a different example of, uh, that shows a slightly uh, uh, additional features of this hypermyelination phenotype, a trans uh, transmission electron micrographs of the corpus callosum. So here again is the corpus callosum. This is a bundle of uh, uh, nerve fibers that connect the right and left hemispheres of our brain. And when you cut that uh, corpus callosum perpendicular to the plane that you're looking at and turn it on its end, you're looking at a cross section of the nerve. And you can see them here in the wild type, uh, very prominently displayed with this uh, sort of outer ring that's very clear. And when you look in the, the knock-in mutant, you know, where have all the, the myelinated neurons gone, right? They're certainly underrepresented here in these, uh, in these micrographs. The neurons are actually there. You can see them at higher magnification much more easily. This is only 5,000 fold magnified. So the neurons are actually there, but they're not myelinated anymore. And so when you count these, you find that there's an increased number of unmyelinated axons in the corpus callosum of these knock-in mice. That's not the only characteristic that you can uncover in looking at these images. When you look at the myelinated uh, neurons and you can measure the thickness of the myelin layer, which is the, the black layer that is ensheathing these neurons. You do this on hundreds of, of neurons you find that the, the myelin layer is not as thick, right? And so it has uh, decreased insulative properties in the knock-in relative to wild-type animals. And presumably this contributes to its diminished capacity as well. So there are um, really two major findings that have come out so far of the studies on this particular model, and they're indicated here. That the disease pathogenesis involves defects that reduce both the number of mature myelinating oligodendrocytes and the ability of those cells to produce a myelin sheath of normal thickness. And I haven't shown you all of the data to support that point, but but you know, we have uh, we have it, and it's in fact uh, published in this article that we reported uh, last year. So uh, we're continuing to work on these animals to learn more about uh, what's happening at the cellular and molecular level. But we wanted at the same time to, uh, to expand our uh, view of what this particular mutation could do to cells other than the oligodendrocytes. And so we've made a new model to do this. I'm going to present just one slide showing this model and what we've learned about it. This is unpublished work. Um, and, and this particular model, a second model of poultry-related leukodystrophy is one we call POLR3A TAMKI. And this is a whole body inducible poultry-related leukodystrophy model. So the way that we have uh, engineered this mice is that we're using uh, uh, you know, genetic tools, very familiar genetic tools, uh, where the mutation can be conditionally induced in all cells in the mouse, but we do this postnatally. So the animals are not, they don't have the mutations from conception. They only develop disease after we treat them with a small molecule that induces the recombination that leads to the expression of the mutation. And so 
what's important about this model from our perspective is that it allows the assessment of the effect of the leukodystrophy mutation uh, on the entire CNS population, that not just the oligodendrocytes, but the, the neurons, the astrocytes, the microglia, and so on. But it also allows us to look at potential effects of the mutation on non-CNS tissues, right? And so this, we hope, will help inform perhaps some of the uh, other phenotypes we've heard about uh, at this meeting. And so uh, our experimental regimen here involves uh, treating the mice with tamoxifen about seven days after they've been weaned. We do five treatments every other day. And then in the first series of behavioral experiments that we've done, about 14 days after the initial injection of tamoxifen, we put the animals in a behavioral spectrometer. And uh, this particular instrument has a video tracking uh, that allows us to monitor the mice's activity in this chamber over a period of time. And then pattern behavior recognition software can go in and look at what the mice are doing and identify particular behaviors that have been impacted. And what you can see down here are some of those behaviors that relate to locomotion. Right? So the, um, this is the track link. So this is measuring the, uh, the distance that the mice are covering in the chamber over a particular period of time, either uh, uh, six or nine minutes. And you can see pretty clearly that this whole body uh, knock-in uh, has uh, reduced track length uh, relative to the wild-type animals. They're not moving around the environment uh, to the same extent as wild-type. Um, uh, right, they, they also spend uh, less time running and they also spend more time standing still. Right? And these are the behaviors shown in this in the center and the right. And those behaviors seem to get worse as a function of time. So as we look at say 42, 49, 56, and 63, you see the bigger difference or yeah, increase in effect uh, in the knockout relative to the wild type. And so, um, so this piece of information and other, other data that we have suggests that uh, that these mice have a more severe course than the original pulse 3 CKA mice where the mutation was just limited to the oligodendrocytes. And we're hopeful that this is going to provide uh, much more information about the cellular impact of the leukodystrophy mutation that we can learn from and help to inform what's going on in patients. So uh, I think that's really all I wanted to, uh, to present today to tell you uh, sort of an update of where we are and where we're headed. Uh, so the key points, if you take nothing away from what I said, this is your slide. Uh, we have two models uh, in mice now that, that reproduce phenotypes of poultry related leukodystrophy. And these enable studies on the cellular and molecular basis of this disease that will lead to a better understanding of disease pathogenesis. And importantly, the mice will provide a critical model for preclinical genetic and pharmacological testing of approaches that we hope will be effective at mitigating the consequences of this disease in patients. That's our goal. So I have some uh, people I need to acknowledge, the, the people in my lab who have contributed to this work, uh, a graduate student, Emilio Merhab, who will be pre presenting his thesis defense in the next couple of weeks, has been uh, one of the important drivers of this work. Uh, Christian Lavados and, and Robin Moyer, who is not only uh, you know the right hand in the lab for me, but uh, uh, a huge source of uh, academic inspiration, and uh, in fact a co-PI on uh, on our uh, grant support for the National Institute of Health. We've also had uh, great support from people in the Department of Pathology in the analysis of electron microscop microscopic images and and uh, immunofluorescence studies. The, uh, Maria Galanello in the Animal Behavioral Core, obviously we've depended a lot on her and she's been fantastic at training Emilio in, in these kinds of experiments. And in other studies that I haven't shown you, uh, we've also done uh, magnetic resonance imaging in these animals to, to try and use a technology that is 
so important in the patient population where we can see similar kinds of things going on. And uh, that data is also in the paper that, that we presented last year, but I haven't shared it with you today. But the people in the Griff Magnetic Resonance Center uh, were vital in uh, collecting and analyzing those images, of course, too. So uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Um, so the short answer is we haven't really gotten to those experiments yet. Uh, we definitely want to. Uh, yeah, sorry. The the, the question is. Uh, have we uh, begun to analyze uh, these mice in terms of the hypermyelination phenotype or looked at uh, the, the development of this phenotype uh, as a function of time to know when should we start inducing um, uh, the disease in this model? And, and so the answer is no, we haven't really gotten there yet. We, we decided on the particular uh, regimen that we used just out of convenience, right? So the, the mice have been weaned for, for one week. That's when we start the treatment. So they have a little bit of time to get used to not being with the mother. And then we induce the disease. It, it certainly is possible in this model to induce the disease uh, earlier. Uh, one can deliver tamoxifen to pregnant dams to induce recombination in the pups in utero. Uh, that comes with some risk of uh, the pups not all making it to term sometimes. So we may be limited to some extent in, in doing it at that early. Um, but clearly we can push things longer as well. And it might be interesting to do that and see uh, sort of maybe a, a late onset type of Luca distri model using this particular system. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Yes. It's, it's very difficult. So the question is, uh, how does the phenotype of the yeast strains correlate with uh, uh, the patient population? And it's really difficult to draw straight lines between these things, in part because of the variability of phenotypes in the patients, right? I think things are a little more straightforward in yeast, and we can certainly rank order the severity of these mutations quite readily. That's not to say that yeast doesn't have genetic modifiers of phenotype as well. They most certainly do, but we haven't been able to uh, connect the dots in that way. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, things were definitely slowed down by the fact that the mice, uh, sorry, the question, <laughs> the question is about uh, the, the time frame for development of the knowledge from sort of start to finish with respect to this animal model and how that compares to other disease models. Um, it could have gone a little faster if we hadn't have had the, uh, the problem with the mice not exhibiting the, the same sensitivity to the mutations as the, the humans apparently do. So that could have trimmed maybe two years off the process. So for us, we got started in this uh, probably in 2016. Um, and you know, we had enough data by the end of uh, 
2020 to put together a manuscript and and uh, and get it published. So, you know, you can imagine a five-year uh, timeline being shortened to maybe three years. So that's pretty pretty fast. You've got to have all of your uh, all of your things lined up and the funding in place, of course, to do this. But this is certainly achievable. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, uh, the question is, how does the, the tamoxifen drug uh, induce the mutation in these mice? So this is a, a, a common a genetic approach that people, uh, experimental biologists use in the mouse genetics field. And it's a, it's a genetic trick where the, the important element here is the, actually a bacterial recombinase that does homologous recombination in bacteria, but it also does it in mammalian cells when you express it in these cells. This recombinase is expressed in these mice, but its ability to function is controlled because the recombinase is fused to another protein, the estrogen receptor, and its ability to work is limited because the estrogen receptor pre-recombinase chimeric protein is held in the cytoplasm of the cells until you provide tamoxifen and then it translocates into the nucleus, initiates recombination, and now you start expression, expressing the, the gene of interest in this case. So uh, th there's nothing really untoward about the use of this particular uh, uh, estrogen uh, uh, antagonist uh, in, in these mice to do these kinds of experiments. It's a, it's a common genetic uh, approach that's used in the field. Yeah. Great, thank you. So for our next presentation, we have Dr. Jun Xie and Dr. Guangping Gao talking about uh, the gene therapy project that we that we mentioned earlier and its current status. And we have a video for that. So we are going to try to pull that up. No, okay, one sec. We're going to work on getting a password and then trying to pull it up. And then Mac and stuff, we're going to get the agenda back on track. So you guys will be next following this video.